Welcome you to the American Kratom Association Advocacy Training Webinar. Uh, my name is Pete Canlin. I'm the Executive Director at the American Kratom Association. I'm joined tonight by Mac Haddo, who is the Senior Fellow on Public Policy at the AK. Uh, we're going to be talking about tonight a, a few different topics. One, uh, how you can best be an advocate for Kratom, for keeping Kratom legal or, or for uh, pro-Kratom legislation. Uh, what to do when you do reach out to an elected official. Uh, some do's and don'ts uh, around that, but then also talking a little bit more about the changing landscape that we're seeing with uh, the FDA, the, the recent news that, that we've put out there that the FDA is, has folks monitoring uh, Kratom supporters, uh, social media, uh, email sent out by the AK, uh, how, how you better best can uh, communicate with other Kratom advocates as we all work towards the, the common goal of keeping Kratom legal. So we really appreciate you joining us tonight. We will be opening this up to question and answer at the end of the call. Uh, so if you have uh, questions, you can either wait to then or you can uh, add them to the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. So we're, we're very happy to have you join us tonight. So without any further delay, I will turn the time over to uh, Mac Haddo, the Senior Fellow of Public Policy at the AKA. Mac. Uh, thank you, Pete, and welcome to everyone who's joined us this evening uh, for this, this advocacy training. And it really is more of a, uh, an opportunity for us to share some best practices, good ideas about how we can most effectively communicate with local officials and state legislators, and to some extent, uh, members of the U.S. Congress, in our fight to protect Kratom. Uh, obviously, we need ambassadors to reach out to these elected officials as a part of our efforts, there is absolutely nothing that is better than being able to speak as a constituent from that elected official's district uh, in terms of making the case for keeping Kratom legal. Virtually every time we see uh, or hear from a state legislator or a local county commissioner or a town official about an effort to ban Kratom, it is because someone in their, one of their constituents has reached out and whether they're reacting to an, their own personal experience or whether they're acting upon information that they have gleaned from the internet that is a part of the FDA's narrative, ultimately that's what, what, what motivates these uh, elected officials to take either a positive action to protect Kratom or a negative action to ban it in their communities. And so we just have to recognize how critically important it is to have those who are in those individual members districts being able to be our, our critically important ambassador uh, to speak for Kratom and to tell your personal story and to amplify the important message that we have about the importance of actually protecting Kratom and keeping it legal uh, here in the United States and in your local communities. Uh, some of the best practices in doing that is to always be respectful and always share your personal story. Uh, we're asking for their help, and we want them to understand that despite what they may be hearing, and, and, and I call them major influencers, when they hear from the FDA uh, or they, they see on the internet comments made by WebMD or the Mayo Clinic, all of which are critical of Kratom, that's what makes your voice so much, uh, so much more important than even the AKA reaching out to them and giving them the good science and the data that ought to be compelling because it's just he said, she said when it comes to that kind of, of communication. But when you as a constituent say to your elected official, this has been my personal experience and you don't have to listen to the, uh, the disinformation campaign of the FDA, it carries enormous weight uh, when you do so. So it is very important for every single individual who wants to keep Kratom legal in your local area to join the state's Kratom Consumer Council. You can go to the AK website, you can click on the link and sign up. Our goal was to initially was to have a state captain or chairman in each state, which we have done and then to have a captain for each congressional district, the 435 elected officials uh, that constitute the US Congress uh, that would be able to cover both the congressional district and of course to 
to assist with advocacy work that goes on uh, with their uh, state senators as well. So uh, obviously the Kratom Consumer Council is important if you join because you, you, you get access to a lot of the information that we want to share with these elected officials. And so uh, you are able to provide a very good narrative uh, within the context of the information that we give to you as a tool to communicate with them. Uh, the first step in any effective advocacy effort is to determine which elected official you're wanting to reach out to, and then how do you do that most effectively? The best thing to do is to set up an in-person meeting with the official or a staff member that is assigned to it. Meeting person to person is always the most effective, but as we have learned from this pandemic that we've suffered through for the past year, that uh, meeting person to person is not always possible. But to the extent that you can, please try to arrange those meetings up front. If you, if you aren't able to establish a, a person to person meeting, then obviously you can rely upon Zoom or similar kinds of, of uh, communications platforms that allow you to have a uh, remote conversation. And they are typically free, they're easy to access. Uh, you can even get on and practice a little bit, but bottom line is that that's the second most effective way. And then you can also use email, both as a way to set up the meetings, to follow up on meetings and to get information that you're sharing with them. Uh, and it, it's a quick way to do it. Uh, you obviously just attach some of the documents that you reference in your conversation. And that is a, an enormously effective way to do this. The second step, either print out or email the AK Advocacy Toolkit file. This, uh, this folder contains the documents that are the latest information in the fight to protect Kratom. Things change and sometimes they literally change day to day. Uh, we try to populate the AKA advocacy toolkit file with that latest information. Uh, I've seen a couple of a very informative and very positive scientific research articles that were just published today. And so we try to, to examine those, figure out which best uh, uh, puts our best foot forward and allows for the member of Congress or a, a, state, a state legislative official or their staff to examine and see what reputable scientists in peer reviewed published articles are saying about Kratom. Now we also see on the other side of the coin that there are negative articles that get put out. And even with the process that most journals use of having peer reviewed published uh, uh, information, which means that the author's viewpoints are examined for uh, the, uh, their authenticity, for the scientific judgment, for the tools and the methods that are used, uh, in drawing the conclusions. Even with that process, there are some articles that come out that don't seem to be uh, rigorously evaluated. In some, in some cases, that's because the, uh, the, the journal that they published in uh, doesn't have the same reputation as some of the higher profiles. So we'll make the decision at the AK about which ones are best uh, included into the, at the AK Advocacy Toolkit file for you to use. And we, we ask you to please print it out or email, uh, and, and it's best to email that advocacy toolkit with the links to the member or their staff that you're working with. Step three, share how Kratom has helped either you or a loved one live a better life. This is, we've, we've preached this uh, over and over again, your testimony, your experience, your being able to say that, that as a constituent, that your personal experience with Kratom uh, is, is one that will resonate with that elected official. Uh, I was having a conversation with a member of the Ohio legislature the other day, and he recounted that he had met an individual constituent who had come up to him and introduced themselves and then proceeded to educate him on Kratom having saved, literally saved the life of this individual. And that legislator was moved by that experience. The fact that the, uh, that the, the constituent of his would have the, uh, the gumption and the courage to come up and share what was a, a very personal uh, experience and one that uh, obviously would be difficult in some cases to share in public about how Kratom saved them from an addiction uh, issue that was, uh, that was ruining their lives and potentially could have led to their death. 
Uh, those kinds of personal stories are critically important to us as we win advocates uh, in these legislatures. Step four, look for opportunities to follow up with elected officials by either sharing new information, forwarding articles, and that kind of thing in order to keep that connection fresh. Uh, obviously, you can have a one-off. And, and I'm not diminishing the importance nor the value of a one-off meeting with any elected official. But it is very important that you look for the opportunities to maintain that connection with that elected official or a member of their staff by giving information. And you can see it uh, posted on the AK website. And certainly you can see a lot of the information that's being circulated on the internet, which we're gonna talk about in a second in terms of best practices there as well. Uh, if you know and recognize that you are a powerful advocate for Kratom, it will make you uh, the kind of, of ambassador that we desperately need. And the way that you can tell that you can be that powerful advocate is if you can tell a family member or a fellow Kratom consumer your personal experience, then you are the perfect candidate to be that, uh, that powerful advocate for Kratom. And uh, as you can see in the picture here uh, on the bottom right, that was uh, uh, the group of people, some of the people that showed up in Ohio before the Board of Pharmacy to tell their stories. And we literally uh, packed the room and, and the line stretched outside the room past the security gates and outside into the street with the number of Kratom consumers that showed up to tell their stories on the day that had been designated by the Ohio Board of Pharmacy for a public hearing. It was, it, it was overwhelming to the staff at the Board of Pharmacy, so much so that about three in the afternoon, even though they had several hours more of testimony that was uh, gonna be allowed to be heard because they had a cutoff time, and there were many beyond that where they could have gone well into the night, it was mid-afternoon when the staff waved the white flag and said, we get it, we're gonna rescind our recommendation that was being made to the what's called the JCAR committee, uh, where the legislature would have affirmed the, uh, the Board of Pharmacy's recommendation for scheduling of Kratom. It was the advocates who sat there and spoke story after story, testimony after testimony, where they heard and, and a, a stories that resonated, personal testimonials of the experiences that Kratom consumers had with Kratom and how it helped improve their health and well-being or literally save their lives. So we cannot overemphasize enough that these testimonies are the most powerful tool we have in advocacy. Now, the do's and don'ts in the new reality, and Pete mentioned it earlier. One of the things that the FDA has now done in a very aggressive way is they are monitoring all of the social media platforms for anything that is said about Kratom. So they're watching and they're observing and they're gleaning from the posts and the comments that are made uh, a lot of the information that is helping them to target specific legislators uh, with their disinformation campaign. And so we simply have to be cognizant that we are now living in a different world uh, where the FDA has teams of people that are evaluating what's being said. One of the things, if I could make this recommendation, and I know this, by the way, by in my saying it, it's a difficult recommendation. When we read a negative Kratom article, or we learn of and then watch a video of a news report that's negative to Kratom, then we have a tendency to want to share that to warn people uh, in the Kratom community about this negative story. And so we post it on our Facebook, our Instagram, Snapchat, and those kinds of things. The purpose in doing that is to warn people about this kind of disinformation that is being used. And in some cases, it's, uh, it's the encouragement is made for people to go and comment on the uh, television station or the newspaper's website in order to correct the record. But what that does, it provides an opportunity for A, the FDA to know that this is an important issue to us in the community. And B, it, it highlights the story and the more hits that come, it elevates the search engine optimization that's used by the search engines so when someone Googles Kratom, it is very likely that the result of your post about repeating a negative Kratom story will end up higher on the search results 
when it comes to Kratom because we, albeit innocently and well-intentioned effort, it ends up creating uh, that issue for you. The other thing it does is it allows for a broader number of people to have access to information that may in fact be completely inaccurate. In most cases it is, uh, and then it gets repeated along the way. So uh, my advice is that to the extent that we can restrain our republication of negative Kratom stories, that we should do so on the AKA forum site, uh, where it is very difficult for the FDA to pierce that, although it's not impossible. And we monitor this regularly to find out, you know, uh, to see if we can identify that. But I would, I would limit it, if you say anything at all about it, uh, to those kinds of sites where we can have uh, this kind of discussion. Uh, another area that the FDA is closely monitoring is the Reddit forums on Kratom. Uh, they are watching to see what people are saying about the patterns of use of Kratom, how it's being used, the therapeutic benefits that it offers, and they're looking to see if any vendors who are marketing Kratom products are making impermissible therapeutic uh, claims that they can, the FDA then can use to demonstrate that this is an industry that's undisciplined, incapable of regulating itself, and therefore has to be regulated by the, uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act interpretation as it is constructed by the FDA. So that's a real problem for us. And so uh, as difficult as this advice may be to follow, I strongly encourage everyone to forego the reposting of negative articles. I'll give you an example of how important this is. Uh, the AKA maintains a monitoring service of uh, the postings that are made uh, it, with news stories across the country. Uh, we get a report on those news stories every four hours, uh, and we are able then to send out an information pack to the reporter that has either written the story or produced it on a video and giving them the facts about Kratom. As we have observed the number of negative Kratom stories from 2016, and then each year from that point forward, we have seen a significant reduction in the number, the gross number of negative Kratom stories. We have also seen an increase and a fairly dramatic increase in the number of what I would call balanced Kratom stories. It doesn't mean that, uh, that there still isn't a lot of the bad information that's promulgated by the FDA but what it does mean is that they're, the reporters are taking a more balanced approach and they are giving both sides of the story. We may not like the story at the end because it contains completely inaccurate information, but it's, you know, it's difficult sometimes if you're a reporter or even a common citizen to be able to determine what the FDA is lying about and what they're not lying about. And trust me, they're lying on a good part of the negative association of arguments that they claim uh, support their efforts in order to uh, schedule Kratom as a Schedule One substance and essentially ban it from the marketplace. So uh, these issues get really complicated if we don't exercise a little bit of discipline on our end to make sure that we are uh, including in the dissemination to the public information that helps. We've also seen uh, an increase in the number of positive Kratom stories. And of course, those are Free, you know, obviously you, you can republish those and repost them. We want those to be out there. Now, you, as I have, heard many people say, oh, well, you know, once you start Googling Kratom, well, Kratom is really bad because FDA says it's bad. You would think that the American public would have the right to trust anything that the FDA said with respect to public safety because they are tasked with the mission of protecting the public. But we have seen from sad experience over the past several decades that the FDA is prosecuting their own agenda, promoting their, a very self-serving model where they make money in order to pay for additional staff and increase their equipment and resources at the FDA using user fees that are paid by big pharma drug manufacturers uh, to the FDA as a part of a new drug application process. And so it is natural that the incentives for the FDA would, would reside in those products that are going to result in an increase in user fee revenue to the FDA. That's the reality. And so they're going to do whatever they can in the areas of dietary supplements or natural products or herbal remedies or natural plants to discourage anyone 
from uh, availing themselves of a health and wellness and well being situation by using those products. The FDA is just biased against them and they will continue to, uh, to prosecute that bias as best as they can. So uh, th that sort of outlines some of the, the processes that, we, uh, uh, that we're gonna have. Before we go to Q&A, there are a couple of things that I also would like to cover. Uh, we hear a lot in the Kratom community about uh, some people say, we, we want Kratom to be legal, but that does not mean that we want Kratom to be regulated. Now, this is an interesting theoretical discussion that obviously benefits from all of us participating. Uh, in a perfect world, one would think that by not regulating Kratom and therefore allowing it to be legal, that that is the very best outcome. But unfortunately, that is a false choice. We do not have the, the ability to say that we want Kratom legal and not regulated because under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, all of these products and substances like Kratom are regulated. We firmly take the position that Kratom is not an unapproved drug. Uh, to the extent that there are vendors out there that are using therapeutic claims in order to induce consumers to purchase their products, the, 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 those vendors are guilty of marketing an unapproved drug and they should be stopped from doing so. Uh, they're the, if you want to market a Kratom product as a dietary supplement, which allows you to make some very specific what are known as structure function claims, then you may also attempt to do that and find yourself in violation of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act for which the FDA can in fact put you out of business for not complying with those laws. Uh, the AK supports this because again, it's about intended use and we don't think that it is a good regulatory position for us to be in to say that we should allow for any vendor to say whatever they want with respect to therapeutic claims or structure function claims. Where Kratom is properly classified is as a food. And now I know that seems counterintuitive in some form because it's not a food like you would uh, you know, cook a steak on the grill or it's not a hamburger, but it is a consumable product that is plant-based that is under the, the definitions and classifications provided by the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act a food. And here's the hard part for many to understand. Foods are regulated. Uh, they are regulated in order to prevent salmonella contamination, E. coli contamination, and, and heavy metal contamination. And so any food product, including leafy lettuce, uh, fruits, those kinds of things, which are naturally grown products, not even processed foods, are subject to regulation by the FDA. And in some cases, very stringent regulations. If you are a lettuce manufacturer today, you have to submit to and prove that you are able to trace back that head of lettuce to the farm where it originated because if there is a salmonella, E. coli, or other contaminant outbreak with heavy metals, for example, the FDA has the right to go back to the farm, the source of the problem, in order to identify what remedial actions need to be taken. Without regulation, they simply couldn't do it, and ultimately that would lead to the banning of lettuce. The alternative is a reasonable regulatory system in order to allow for, in this case, Kratom to remain on the market as a food. Uh, the, the other standard for regulation is whether or not a, a processed product is in fact following good manufacturing practices in the, in the formulation of the food product. So for example, Unless you have the leaf, the raw leaf, where you might have an argument about the limiting the regulatory control only to the contaminant level issues. But if you do anything to process that food into a finished product, which includes the drying and grinding of a kratom leaf into powder for the convenience of shipping to make sure it's safer to get into the United States, that becomes a finished product that is subject to another uh, section of the uh, GMP regulations that govern how processed foods are then produced safely. So there are specific requirements for a uh, following protocols and maintaining a master record of how the lo each lot of material is used in the processing of a finished product. And that would include 
the way that it is uh, that it is ground up. Uh, if if you regrind it from the powder that you buy as a raw a bulk raw material, uh, the way that you uh, then package it, uh, the kind of machinery that you use, the processes for the machinery, the cleaning between the batches, uh, the proper labeling of the packaging material, uh, all of those things are very important components of a regulated food. Uh, process that the FDA has every right under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to implement and require of food manufacturers. Uh, it is impossible in the current landscape, in the regulatory landscape in the United States, for Kratom to be completely and totally unregulated and as much wishing as a, a individual consumer or a vendor might want to apply to it, it won't change anything. Uh, there are strict regulations that are grounded in the statute, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. There is plenty of case law that restricts the FDA's overreach on those regulations, but at the same time supports and underpins the basic regulatory framework that food products are required in order to, to meet in order to be available to the public. And that includes the processing, the, uh, the equipment, uh, and the, the standard operating procedures and all that and the labeling that's done for it. So uh, just I encourage everyone to understand that the realistic view of a properly regulated marketplace has minimal regulations, but some are there and they will always be there and we will never be in a position, no matter how hard people want to argue about it, of being completely unregulated by just saying, okay, we can bring Kratom in and we don't have to listen to the FDA about a single solitary thing. When you see a Kratom product, and I see them frequently on Facebook, that is packaged in what appears to be a Ziploc bag and somebody has written with a Sharpie on it, the, the particular strain of that Kratom product and the amount of Kratom that's in it, that is an illegal product. No questions asked. And as, as much as the vendor may want to argue, oh no, I'm just doing the right thing here. And, and you know, I've got a trusted source. If they haven't submitted that Kratom uh, to the, the certificate of analysis kind of investigation that determines that they are free from the contaminants and, that, and that's both at the time of the processing of the product and the finished product, testing at both ends of that, then they are marketing an illegal Kratom product. And it opens the door for the FDA to have additional regulation because again, the, the argument is that this is not an industry nor a, a Kratom marketplace that can be trusted to do the right thing. I know that this is controversial, but it is, however, the fact of what we're doing. Uh, there are, there's also other uh, groups within the Kratom community that are hurting us overall. Uh, I had a conversation with a member of the uh, legislature in a Midwestern state who recounted for me the story that he had read from a publication online called the Kratom Herald. There could not be a more uninformed uh, publication than is evidenced by statements that are being made in the Kratom Herald. Now, I'm sure it's well-intentioned. The person who publishes that information uh, thinks that they're right. I'm not disputing. And they have the right to their opinion, by the way. But I've tried to reach out and, they, and that individual has refused to even have a conversation. I'd welcome the opportunity to have a public debate on some of the issues that he feels strongly about. This particular article was a little bit surprising to me because what it said was, and he's anti-AKA, and I get that, what he said was the AKA was trying to promote this uh, argument that the, the uh, restatement of the import alert by the FDA didn't change things at all. It's almost as if, if that publisher is speaking from the FDA's song sheet, because that is exactly what the FDA spokesperson told people when they said, oh, we republished the import alert standard procedure whenever there's a change in the information on individual vendors. That's true. But the reason and the timing of that import alert restatement was derivative of the very bad press that the FDA was getting because of the HHS rescission letter that completely removed from the DEA's consideration the FDA's recommendation for the scheduling of metrogenine and 7-hydroxymetrogenine. And so in order to get 
back out into the media using their extensive pipeline of disinformation, the FDA used the excuse of then saying, okay, the, uh, the import alert has uh, been updated. It was updated by changing the name of an individual to the name of the company of that individual. It had zero material impact on anything. It could have been published 10 years from now and nothing would have been different between now and that 10 years. They chose now in order to get a press release out to get public attention and the Kratom Herald played right into their hands. It is a mistake and yet that's an advocate for keeping Kratom legal. That same author, publisher, uh, likes to take shots at the AKA and on a consistent basis. And I would ask you to simply consider the source, but it's hurting us as we go forward. We are working now uh, with in a number of state legislatures where the, uh, the state legislators or their staffers are reading this nonsense and they're being impacted by it. I was asked in the state of Florida why we needed to have this regulation when there were uh, pro-Kratom advocates on the internet, specifically referencing the Kratom Herald, uh, saying that you don't need any of these regulations. You don't need the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. Again, I'll tell you that's a false choice. It's untrue, it's wrong. If we do not have the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, we will be on the road to the de facto banning of Kratom because the FDA will exercise the authorities it has, overstretch their authorities like they've done with the import alert. And at the end of the day, we will lose this battle. And so again, I encourage you not to repost the nonsense that is being peddled by these uninformed people who have their own agenda, by the way. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What could possibly be the agenda of the Kratom Herald publisher or people that follow in the same way? There is a tension within our industry that says, okay, why should I, as a Kratom vendor, have to submit to FDA regulations that are going to increase the cost of doing business. It means that I will have to pay for testing. It's expensive. It means that I will have to buy equipment that is compliant with good food standards of, of good manufacturing uh, of a food product. Very similar to what's going on, on, on over in Indonesia right now where the responsible growers are shifting to food grade grinding machines and blending machines uh, and away from the unsanitary uh, World War II era copy grinding machines and blenders that were being used in Indonesia that are fraught with problems. The same thing is true here. And so the objection is, well, if I have to buy that equipment, it increases the cost of doing business. If I have to package my Kratom materials to some standard that includes putting the name of the manufacturer and listing the ingredients and following compliant labeling guidelines, that increases the cost of producing a Kratom product. If a small vendor then has to comply with all of the GMP guidelines in the handling of the, uh, the production of a Kratom product, which means that they have to keep records, they have to demonstrate with a master log the handling of all the equipment, they have to clean the machines between the production of batches, and they have to make sure that they uh, test at the end of the process the finished product. All of that adds up to money. I get that. And that means that those small vendors are not going to be able to undercut the big vendors in terms of price. At the end of the day, it's possible that the small vendor that avoids all of those costs is not compliant, is still gonna be able to sell a safe Kratom product, but that's a risk. And, and the, the law, the statute that governs the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act is all about reducing risk to consumers because it doesn't take very many incidents where there is a a major adverse event that requires hospitalization of consumers or the deaths of those consumers before the energy behind a ban on Kratom will get picked up again. And that's what we're trying to avoid. And so as good hearted as these people may be, as well intentioned as they may be, and as much as they wanna cloak themselves in this first amendment right to be able to say and do anything they want, that is not realistic because the difference between commercial speech which the courts have ruled consistently, the FDA has the right to regulate and individual speech is vastly different because an individual has the right in order to make individual choices and express their views about the uses of those products that they, that they use to maintain their health and well-being is much different than a commercial entity that benefits economically by making the very same claims. So we have to realize we have to, frankly, we have to live in a world where 
we are responsible citizens along the way. So uh, that's the, the bottom line in terms of where we need to be as a, the Kratom community to protect the legality of Kratom going forward. Uh, and so, I, and, and that's an important thing. I'll handle a couple of these questions uh, that are on the Q&A thing, and then we can open it up. Um, so uh, suggestions for a more strategic approach where it is illegal, where big pharma resides. Well, there are today uh, the, the seven states where Kratom is illegal. We are working hard to unwind those bans on Kratom. Uh, we're working actively in Wisconsin, in Vermont, in Rhode Island, um, in uh, Arkansas and Illinois. Uh, we, we are not having any success at this point in Alabama, but it is on our target list over the summer for interim committee meetings and hopefully for action in the next legislature. Uh, and we don't have anything going in Indiana currently, although we're having discussions with them about doing an interim committee meeting. So in those areas, you have to comply with the law. Uh, you don't want to be in a position where you are observed by a law enforcement officer with Kratom and they use that as a pretext for an arrest. Uh, and we know that's happened. I mean, there are plenty of examples of where that kind of thing is happening. So my uh, recommendation is join us in those states where it is currently banned to work to unwind those bans uh, and to influence those legislatures uh, with your personal testimonials because that will cover uh, the, uh, the, the area, that particular issue. The second question, do I have any specific recommendations on how I can use my position as a medical student to put a unique spin or leverage on my approach to creative advocacy? Thank you. That's a, there, you'll find, many people will find themselves in a position where they're able to become influencers. And so, yes, I think that armed with, particularly in the medical community, with good peer-reviewed publications that you share with your colleagues and encourage them to evaluate it, that will, that will have dramatic impacts. I just read of a circumstance where there are some doctors who are recommending to their patients that they try Kratom as an alternative to uh, other uh, pain medications that uh, have potential safety risks associated with it. We saw in a Reddit forum a couple of weeks ago, the example of uh, a, a woman who repeated that her husband had been, been entrapped in the VA system uh, because of the, the pain, uh, the, the various protocols they have for uh, treating pain patients. And they actually, one of the, the uh, physician's assistants in the VA system had encouraged this individual to use Kratom. So I think we're seeing a shift um, in, the, uh, in this entire process uh, and the attitude of the medical community. And I think we're going to continue to be able to educate that community to have a independent view, despite what they hear from the FDA. And by the way, when you hear people say, well, not only do I hear it from the FDA, I hear it from Mayo Clinic, and I hear it from WebMD, and I hear it from MedWatch. It is a fact that the FDA has cooperative information sharing agreements with those institutions, and they are repeating themselves. And you can go on our website and find the FDA loop of information. All they're doing is repeating the same disinformation back and forth with one another. And if you look at it, um, it, is, it is absolutely critical uh, that we fight back on those kinds of, of issues. So let's keep uh, our, our feet to the, to the fire here. Um, so the, uh, the, the question from Melody, who's a great advocate and a great resource, by the way, and thank you, Melody, for all the work you do, because she keeps me on my toes and gives me a lot of great information, and I really appreciate it. But she makes the point, and it's a good one, that the Kratom stories are often posted on news outlets, uh, and the, the, the question is, do you recommend not commenting on their Facebook post? So this is, this is an interesting question. Most of the time, I would say, yes, don't comment on it because it just gives them more power in terms of the comments. But I think that there, when it's a particularly egregious and, and a story that has absolutely disinformation in it, then I think it's appropriate to comment. And if there are 150 comments on that page, the editors are gonna look at it and they're gonna see the overwhelming people said you are wrong on, uh, on the, uh, the science about Kratom and the fundamental elements of the story are wrong. And, and as I say, things have gotten better, but there's still those stories out there. They're so anti-Kratom, they make your blood boil. So yes, I think that you use judgment here. Uh, glad to answer any questions if someone wants to send a link to me or to Pete. 
and we'll evaluate it and make a recommendation on a case by case basis. We're glad to do that uh, because I think that's important. But it, and it's, so there's not a blanket don't or do. It's a question of looking at the individual story. So thank you, Melody, and again, thank you for all the great work and so many others out there uh, that are doing the same thing. We, we deeply appreciate the work. Uh, next question is, what is the best source to find research plans, programs, or results that are scientifically objective regarding the use of Kratom by human beings? A couple of great things are happening right now. Uh, one is that the, uh, the, the language, the report language that was passed in the 2020 uh, appropriations bill and will be included again, in, I'm sorry, in 2020 and 21, and will be hopefully in the 2022 is specific language saying that the uh, NIH need and uh, agencies AHRQ at the Department of Health and Human Services are instructed to do research, including human clinical trials in the areas where they have seen a spike in opioid deaths. Now th that that's the instruction. That's it's a little more complicated to do what the Congress has asked them to do. Uh, than just saying those words, but it's a step in the right direction. We're going to see progress, and I think that uh, that we're going to see more and more of the objective uh, science that uh, relates to Kratom, and so uh, I, I would suggest you go to our science section on the website. We're now improving, and go, we're going to republish the website in a new form. You'll see a lot more of the science articles that are timely and up-to-date that you can share, and we'll try to keep that posted uh, as best we can. Um, then the next question, is there not a congressional committee armed with science about Kratom which could bring, the, could bring the FDA in front of it, challenging the FDA's disinformation campaign to the states? The answer is yes. Uh, in fact, an opportunity that's fairly unique is going to come uh, before the Congress here as soon as the newly elected Biden administration names an FDA commissioner. Part of that process is that that nominee for the FDA commissioner slot will be required to go and visit with senators who have advice and consent to approve that nomination. And we will have those senators and their staff teed up in order to ask questions with relate to Kratom. They also, as a courtesy, go and talk to the Appropriations Committee people on the House side uh, very frequently when the nominee wants to make sure that they're checking all the boxes to understand what the priorities of the members, members of Congress are. And when that happens, we're gonna be active in encouraging that the questions about Kratom uh, be posed to it. And certainly a, uh, a key champion of the Kratom Consumer Protection Act is Congressman Mark Pocan, who sits in an influential position on the House Appropriations Committee that oversees uh, the FDA and appropriates money for them. And he's been a great advocate and will continue to be. And that will provide us with that opportunity to do part of what you've suggested, Carol. The other thing that will happen is that when we get the Federal Kratom Consumer Protection Act filed, there will be hearings on it. And that's where the FDA will have to come and, uh, and actually account for what they have done and what they have said. And so we're gonna be very aggressive on, uh, on this. Uh, then uh, where can we get the Advocacy Toolkit? Uh, that's on our AKA website. You can email Pete if you have trouble finding it. Again, we're gonna update the website, make it a lot easier to use. Uh, and so I think that uh, that'll be a great resource. Um, then uh, a question uh, pretty relevant. It said, I went through the same process by way of an e-juice manufacturing regulations in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Now I'm in Missouri. What do you think that looks like for the future of Kratom users overall? It, and do you have contacts offhand from Missouri? We can talk about that offline directly in terms of the contacts, but Missouri is, uh, is well, uh, well along in its evaluation and hopefully passage of the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. Uh, it passed the House with overwhelming margins. I think there was one vote against it. Uh, it might've been unanimous. And we got through unanimously in the Senate General Laws Committee and it's looking for a Senate vote here in the next couple of weeks. So Missouri is gonna be a great place uh, for Kratom uh, vendors that follow the regulations to do business. And we hope people will look to that uh, state as sort of an example, along with the four states have already passed it, Oklahoma. Uh, just uh, a past you know, 45 to one in the Senate. Uh, great work by Kratom advocates, Adam Hall and others on the ground in Oklahoma that delivered that win. It's uh, on the governor's desk. And I think that uh, will be signed soon. And that'll be the fifth state, the Missouri following shortly after. We're gonna keep adding to those numbers. Uh, so we'll keep working on it. Uh, Cami Davis, another great advocate for Kratom. Uh, I encourage everyone to go and, and, uh, and join her group on, uh, on Facebook. 
She asked, some people think the government will be able to make changes to the KCPA or add regulations once the KCPA is enacted into legislation. Is this true? So great question, Cami. Here's the, here's the truth of it. The uh, early model that we used for the Kratom Consumer Protection Act did rely, unfortunately, to, on too much regulatory power being given to a regulatory agency in the state. We have learned from that and we refined our model Kratom Consumer Protection Act to simply make an affirmative statement that Kratom has to meet the following standards. And if, if a uh, retailer is violating those standards, selling a product that's not compliant, that then there's a process in order to correct that or remove the product from the market. Um, we don't have, there's only one state uh, where we've had this really robust regulatory model and that's the state of Utah and they have been fantastic to work with. So we didn't have any dangerous or negative side effects from that. We've guarded against it going forward. Unfortunately, there are a couple of states where uh, some of the state regulatory bodies want to have regulatory control. And so we may have to make some compromises to get the bill passed. Uh, and we'll just have to monitor that and regulate it along the way. Once the, uh, the regulatory framework is authorized under the statute and the statute will have significant limitations on what the regulatory body can do, I think we'll be fairly safe. It's always possible that some regulatory body will try to expand their regulatory authority and that would require us to come back in and have the legislature specifically restrain uh, that regulatory agency from doing anything that would be completely uh, detrimental to the effect of and the purpose for which the Kratom Consumer Protection Act was originally passed by the legislature. So we're at small risk for that happening, but it's not a major problem and there's a remedy to it if we find someone that's gone off the rails. Uh, we are very pleased with the states that have implemented the Kratom Consumer Protection Act and with the Oklahoma and Missouri language that's currently in the past form. Uh, and we see that in other states as we go forward. Ohio is an interesting state. Uh, to just give you an example that addresses Cami's point. Uh, the state of Ohio, Department of Agriculture, Food Safety Division strongly objected to the Kratom Consumer Protection Act language, but after extensive negotiations, they agreed to allow for a hybrid uh, of a, the, much like they did for the hemp law, which creates a marketing opportunity for Kratom products that will it, it, frankly have less regulation than uh, that they just did, simply do, did not want to be a part of going, going along with that. So uh, that's where we are uh, with those issues. We watch them in each individual case. We are diligent to make sure that the regulatory body doesn't go off the rails. Uh, we're struggling a little bit with that in Oregon right now, where the uh, agriculture department is looking for an exorbitant fee for registration of Kratom products to be sold in that state because they're really just looking for a payday on the backs of the Kratom consumer. And so we're resisting that, but we're gonna to continue to work with these uh, legislatures uh, along the way. Uh, next question is, uh, is it possible to have any sort of printed information publication from the AK, a monthly newsletter, quarterly magazine, something to be handed, handed out that looks professionally done? Great, uh, a great question and, and, and a great recommendation uh, on the legislative front, frankly, we found ourselves in a position where we can't be too transparent in the sense of telling every step of what's happening in the legislatures, because as we mentioned earlier, the FDA is monitoring the AKA site. And when we disseminate information, uh, unless we're actually telling individual advocates to do something, we do that by email. Uh, and, and then we, we get on at, at right at the, at the end of that process with the Facebook notices. But frankly, the FDA is watching and we have had specific instances where the FDA has gone in knowing what we're doing because we published it and they're actually calling those legislators and creating havoc uh, and upsetting our plans. And we've simply got to develop a better communications channel and we are literally working on that now in order to bypass some of the public uh, social media platforms they expose us to that risk. But the idea of having a, uh, a monthly newsletter, you can, uh, you can ping uh, the AK information line and you will uh, find, you can get put on the list for what will be a newly created monthly newsletter that has that professional look that I think you'll be pleased with. Um, so, uh, so that's where I think we're gonna, we're, we're gonna find ourselves. And absolutely is needed to be done. And I appreciate your, uh, uh, your, your making that recommendation. Uh, next question is, 
where can we direct people for, to verifiable procreatum research? That will be on the AK Science section of our website, and that's where you can find the best, most up-to-date information. If someone sees something that ought to be there and we haven't placed it there for whatever reason, and maybe because we just missed it, please uh, ping us and we will evaluate it for placement there. We want every advocate to have access to the best and most current research. The very, the very thing that was referenced by the Assistant Secretary for Health in the 2018 rescission letter, where he told the DEA to remove the recommendation for scheduling because of the FDA's reliance on outdated science. And we want the, the newest science to obviously be available along the way. Um, so uh, please summarize and distill the reasons for FDA's hostility. Uh, this, is, this is almost a potpourri of, of explanations that can be provided, but I think the simplest explanation is this. The FDA had its hostility against Kratom that far uh, superseded the 2012 import alert, far superseded uh, Scott Gottlieb getting to the agency. The truth is there is an embedded anti-natural products policy division at the FDA that is against all natural products, all herbal products, all dietary supplements, all vitamins, because they want all of that to go through the new drug application process because they, even though they're wrong, they believe that that is the best way to protect the American consumer. And the consumers should not be left to their making independent choices, what they would call at the FDA uninformed choices about the purchase of those kinds of products. They want everything to be vetted as a new drug application. And if that standard were in place, it would destroy a $53 billion dietary supplement industry in the United States that's created hundreds of thousands of jobs and has a, a, a dollar generator that has a significant positive impact on the American economy. And more importantly, delivers to more than 80% of American families who use dietary supplements and vitamins in order to maintain their health and well being, and that forestalls their having to use prescription medications. And therein lies the rub. The FDA, whether we like to, the, the reality is follow the money, whether we like this fact or not, uh, the FDA has gone to the Congress and not gotten sufficient funding in order to, to take care of the mandates in the statute that Congress gives to them. And so their natural inclination was to request and get authority for the uh, user fees on the industries that they regulate. And the first foray into that was the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which when it was passed, uh, just short of 2010, uh, it, uh, it was done specifically to fund for positions uh, for reviews of new drug applications and the sophisticated computer and modeling equipment that was necessary and the analytical equipment, all of which were expensive. Uh, they got that in, it, it, within a couple of years, they were up to about 9% of the total of budget at the Center for Disease, uh, for Drug Evaluation and Research, CEDAR. Uh, and today it's over 67 or 68%. They make money on these applications. And so they're obviously naturally going to favor a user fee situation when it comes to regulating products. And so uh, that's a, a real interesting area that uh, the FDA has gotten embedded in. Uh, that bias is real. Uh, they vigorously opposed the Deshaies Act when it was proposed uh, because uh, on the claim that dietary supplements and vitamins were killing people. And they were right. It was poorly formulated, contaminated and adulterated dietary supplements and vitamins that were killing people because the FDA refused to regulate them because they wanted to force everything through the new drug application process. And by failing to regulate, they created a more unsafe condition that they thought would help them make their argument. It took the Congress in a unanimous vote to, to pass the, uh, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which severely and significantly limited the authority of the FDA. And that's why we have a much better situation with dietary supplements today. So. Uh, it's one of those things I know uh, we all like to say, hey, we should be able to trust our government. But when it comes to the FDA, you cannot, you should not, and no one should be forced to. Uh, everything the FDA says should be met with some measure of skepticism because obviously they've been wrong for decades on this issue of natural products, herbal remedies, and dietary supplements and vitamins. 
Next question, uh, should we take that new survey? Well, there are a couple that are out there. Uh, you can ping uh, the AK information line and ask. And we'd be glad to give you some specific advice. I think most of these surveys are okay. There are some research projects that are ongoing that ask people to participate in a survey. And we, of course, think that, uh, uh, that all of those things are okay along the way. Um, uh, next question, are social media companies aware of Kratom enough to flag this information from the FDA and other organizations that are hostile to Kratom? And they've done that with electoral and disinformation. Uh, the short answer is no, they're not yet. Uh, with the, we find that the social media police will shut down a Kratom, pro-Kratom uh, uh, group as quickly as you can, you can wink your eye. Uh, we have to fight them all the time. And so uh, we haven't reached the level of understanding and, uh, and sophistication in the so social media platforms because they're heavily influenced by the FDA's claims about uh, deaths and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I think that, um, uh, that we are in a position now that we have to continue to be that loyalist fight, use the techniques that are effectively done where you don't spell out Kratom, you use a, a, another uh, a digit in there that, would, uh, that doesn't allow for their algorithms to pick up Kratom, but there are a lot of uh, techniques you can use. We're gonna continue to work with these social media companies to show them that uh, they're wrong on the science and that they need to be uh, far more helpful. Uh, speaking of Missouri, I'm a resident, would like to put myself in a position to advocate for Kratom more so than from my keyboard, what you recommend. Uh, Mark, I think I'm hoping, I'm hoping the ship has sailed on that issue uh, in that the legislature I think is very close to passage, but there will be an opportunity here in the next couple of weeks where you can either from your keyboard or if you would like to go personally uh, when the Senate bill is uh, up for uh, actual vote, uh, we hope that you'll join our efforts there uh, to push it across the uh, finish line. Um, next question, is it possible that the inability to patent Kratom's alkaloid plays a role in Big Pharma's relationship with FDA vis-a-vis -vis Kratom? Great question. So there are two issues here. Uh, Kratom, the, uh, the alkaloids in Kratom could be patented if they were chemically reformulated. Uh, that's common, by the way, because there are many drugs that are in fact um, formulated from natural products and they're just put into a synthesized chemical form. So that's not really the big problem right now for, and there are a couple of patents that are being provided on the basis of a chemical formulation of metrogenine and 7 hydroxy metrogenine. The issue here is that the uh, pharma companies recognize that unless they can provide a significant boost in the therapeutic benefits of Kratom, uh, why would they go through the, uh, the three to five billion 10 year process of going through an NDA when they know at the end of that process that in, in consumers can still go out and purchase a natural, uh, pure, unadulterated Kratom product and have essentially the same effect. So that's the, the big disadvantage I think that the big pharma companies are looking at uh, right now. Um, and so uh, th that's the reality of the marketplace. I think that when the work is completed in the science that has been commissioned by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, that I think you're gonna see uh, a significant number of filings with the patent office to do uh, some Kratom formulations because the truth is that it appears based on this science that Kratom is both effective in the mitigation of pain and is a safe and natural alternative to uh, opioids that have a higher safety profile. Opioids are an important tool in a physician's toolbox to help people manage acute and chronic pain, but they recognize, and even the NIDA director has pointed out, that when you potentially have a natural substance that allows for, in some cases, for pain patients to replace an opioid that has a very high safety profile with a safe substance that is not addictive and it doesn't have the overdose potential, then we should encourage that as a harm reduction policy as opposed to banning it the way that the FDA wants to do. Uh, so, uh, so that's the, the name of the game there. Uh, and then the last couple of questions, uh, are there certain people in the banned states that are better to contact advocate? Please go through the Kratom Consumer Council we will help you guide you along the way as to who we need and the timing of when we need to have that outreach done. So I'd encourage you to do that uh, along the way. And then uh, finally, has there been any legislation or advocacy program in Washington state that I could follow? So the good news is that there has not been any advocacy or any uh, filing of a bill that would ban Kratom or study it, which is the euphemism for banning it. 
uh, we have run into significant resistance from some of the local judges in the state of Washington who have been concerned about the number of their drug court uh, patrons who are in a diversion program from uh, the use of addictive or illegal substances and they're finding many of their patrons are using Kratom and the rule in drug court is that you're not allowed to use any substance that's not on their approved list and of course Kratom is not on the approved list. So it's, it's almost counterintuitive but the rule is you can't use it. It's not that they take a position, frankly, and by the description of the, uh, of the county, one of the district attorneys I spoke with up there, it's just that the rule is that that patient or that patron that is a, a, uh, under the control of the drug court is not permitted to use Kratom. And even though they may be using Kratom to stay away from the illegal substances that got them into trouble in the first place, there's not enough sophisticated understanding of uh, Kratom and what it can do uh, that the judges quite understand yet. So we're gonna to continue to work. And I think that the state of Washington will be a, a KCPA state either next year or the year after at the latest. So 